the mammalian orders alive today uh, were not alive during the Precambrian, the Paleozoic, or the Mesozoic era, in other words, almost all of Earth's history. So there were uh, no rodents, there were no bats, there were no uh, horses, no cows, no dogs, no cats, uh, no whales, uh, no modern group of mammals prior to the Cenozoic era. And as we consider uh, the groups of mammals and ultimately get to ourselves, that includes the order primates, which humans are classified in. So as we look at uh, mammals, there's a subgroup of the live birth theory in mammals, a subgroup of the placental mammals, and then uh, a subgroup of the various orders. The order primates um, did not uh, exist for the majority of Earth's history. And uh, when the age of mammals began, began there were no monkeys, there were uh, no uh, apes. So where did primates come from? Uh, well, both in the fossil record and alive today, there are almost primates or mammals which have some but not all of the features of primates. So tree shrews, like the one here, and another group called flying lemurs, um, they have uh, more features in common with the primates than other groups of mammals, but not enough to actually consider them uh, primates. So uh, primate nests uh, seems to uh, be able to evolve in stages, um, at least by looking at modern uh, animals. And the same conclusion uh, uh, is arrived at if we consider the fossils, because when the uh, Mesozoic era ended, and the Cenozoic era began. The first epoch is what's known as the Paleocene epoch from 65 million years ago to 56 million years ago. Um, there were no primates definitely known where we can say, you know, here's a monkey, here's an ape, this, here's a lemur, here is a primate from the Paleocene. However, there are almost primates, a group known as the plesiodapiforms. And so uh, prior to the appearance of any true primates, uh, there seem to be what uh, are known as the sister group of primates, the plesiodapiforms. Um, so they have some primate adaptations, um, but not enough to consider them uh, primates. So primates seem to evolve in stages, uh, and both uh, a few groups alive today and uh, fossils uh, from uh, the Paleocene uh, seem uh, to uh, confirm uh, that. Um, it was not until the next epoch of the Cenozoic era, the Eocene, uh, in which there are um, fossils which are definitely uh, associated with the order primates, which then begs the question, how would you know? What defines uh, a primate? Why are these things considered primates and these things aren't? And if you found fossils, what would cause you to say this is the fossil of a primate where this is not? Uh, and like all of the taxonomic groups, then there are rules, there are definitions. Primates have these features. Um, one of the big ones is a post-orbital bar. Uh, and this bears a little uh, explanation. So here you have the eye socket, the orbit, and notice that the eye socket is completely surrounded by bone. So there is a, um, a bar of bone around the orbit, a post-orbital uh, bar. Now, don't all animals have that? Um, well, animals once did. Uh, I mean, the vertebrates, that was their uh, ancestral uh, condition. So reptiles had a post-orbital bar. The, bar. the eye was completely surrounded in the, sorry for what Zoom's doing. Um, uh, but the first mammals uh, lost uh, this. Why? No idea. Um, at the same time, uh, the brain case was getting bigger. And so maybe just the genetic changes for the, the large brain case was what, which was an advantage. Also that lost, led to the loss of two small skull bones, which had, uh, completed at uh, the posterior portion of the, the orbit. Um, and because the early mammals were nocturnal and small, mouse size, um, then perhaps it, it just wasn't that, uh, you know, that important. However, once the age of mammals began, a few lineages of, of mammals got the post-orbital bar back. Camels did, horses did, the first members of these groups didn't have a post-orbital bar, but then bones um, uh, grew together. 
Um, and then the same uh, was true of primates. One of the features of primates is forward facing eyes and the eyes get bigger. Obviously, if you're going to live in trees, you wanna be able to look at the branch that you're about to, um, as to grab, your life depends on this, more important than staring out to the side. And thus, the more protection you have for the eye, the, the you know, uh, better served you are uh, for this uh, increasingly valuable uh, sense. So that's a defining feature of the primates. So even this lemur, which is a primitive primate, a prosimian, has forward-facing eyes and has a post-orbital um, uh, bar. Uh, there are many other uh, features of the primates. Uh, the primates uh, would start to uh, make uh, more significant a brain tract, uh, which allows voluntary muscle movement known as the corticospinal tract going from the motor cortex to the spinal cord. It went uh, more inferiorly in the spinal cord, it got bigger and would allow for more and more dexterous movements. And so um, as leaping from branch to branch became more and more important, the nervous system, um, which allowed for this, uh, became more and more important. Uh, the brain got uh, bigger. There are a number of folds, which are dis uh, uh, definitive of uh, primates. Uh, the visual area of the cortex uh, got bigger. In the left hemisphere, uh, the area which humans would ultimately use as a speech uh, evolved and would become uh, more uh, prominent uh, over uh, time. And so there are uh, other features of uh, primates. Um, like most placental mammals, but unlike some, uh, the testes in males would descend into a, a scrotum. Um, and so uh, in the Eocene, a group evolved which had all of these features and they then are known as primates. Now, the first primates lack you know, features which the later primates would have. So notice in this lemur, the snout is still uh, fairly uh, pronounced. And so monkeys did not uh, exist uh, in, the, um, in the Eocene, uh, nor did uh, apes, but more primitive primates. And we do have uh, primitive primates alive today in uh, the lemurs of Madagascar and a few other groups, the, the loris, uh, the pato, and the ai. -I. Um, uh, like many lineages of mammals, uh, the number of teeth uh, was reduced from the original uh, mammal. So if you look at a primitive mammal like an opossum, look at all the teeth. There are five incisors, one canine, three molars, uh, four uh, molars, whereas primates have reduced that to two incisors, one canine, three premolars, three molars, and then the um, higher primates would then lose one of the uh, pre um, uh, molars. Uh, and so uh, there are features which uh, define the, uh, uh, the primates. And then just getting back to the post orbital uh, bar, um, these uh, uh, two uh, bones uh, here were lost in the first um, uh, mammals. That, that's a, a cynodont a reptile um, related to mammals. Um, and so now the hole uh, which uh, the eye occupies is now confluent with uh, the opening for uh, the jaw muscle. So notice this armadillo. There is no separation between where the eye is and where the jaw muscle uh, is. And so um, and that's true of other animals as well. And I had said that, you know, it's kind of silly, um, but because people didn't appreciate this when they found elephant heads, they didn't realize, oh, the eye goes there, the jaw muscles go there. And so then they thought that the hole for at the base of the trunk for the fused nostrils uh, was the eye. And then the idea of a cyclops came to be. Um, notice that this cat almost has a post-orbital uh, bar. Um, the um, uh, frontal and jugal bones almost contact uh, each other. Um, but uh, for primates, this then became one of the defining uh, uh, features of uh, the um, uh, uh, surrounding the eye. So as of the Eocene, uh, you know, 50 some uh, million years ago, uh, there were primates on earth for the first time. But once again, they were not modern 
a primate. So primate nests would, will evolve in stages. So before there were monkeys and apes, there were primates, um, but more primitive primates. And we still have some living representatives of these uh, today. They were once more widespread, um, but they were then later replaced uh, by um, uh, modern lineages. So uh, the diverse lemurs in South, Mar uh, I'm sorry, Michael, uh, the lemurs in Madagascar uh, today are uh, primitive uh, primates, as are uh, the Loris, the Pato, uh, and the Ivy. Some of these are nocturnal. So many early mammals were uh, nocturnal, many mammals alive or today are nocturnal, and many of the early primitive primates are nocturnal. Um, there is only one monkey which is non-turtle uh, in South America, and no old world monkey or, or catarine primate or ape is nocturnal. And so the primates uh, were beginning to uh, place greater and greater importance on uh, vision uh, during uh, the day. Color vision will become uh, important uh, uh, later. Um, uh, and so here you see um, uh, the Lars, it is a nocturnal uh, uh, primate. Uh, notice the forward uh, facing uh, eyes. And so primitive primates evolved uh, in the beginning of the Eocene. Um, monkey, or at least the, uh, uh, the lineage of monkeys and apes, the anthropoid primates, uh, they appear by the end of uh, the Eocene. And there is one prosimian alive today, the tarsier. So all of the lemurs and tarsiers are both called prosimians. They are not anthropoids. But notice that there's more bony protection behind the eye of the tarsier than there is in the lemur. So monkeys, look, the eye is completely encircled by bone. In lemurs, there's bone along the side here, but not all throughout. Um, the tarsier has more than the lemur, but less than the monkey. Um, and so of the various types of prosimians, it's possible that uh, tarsiers uh, are more closely related to the anthropoid uh, primates uh, than uh, the lemurs are, so that the prosimians would include a number of uh, family uh, branches of the family tree with tarsiers being the closest to anthropoid primates. By the end of the uh, Eocene, there are anthropoid primates, which now include monkeys, apes, and humans, but will not include the lemur. That's why the lemur isn't singing the song in this next animation. Um, many early primates, such as early anthropoids, are known in Asia, just like there are um, uh, modern uh, prosimians known from Asia. So while Africa uh, gets uh, certainly a lot of attention with primates, certainly our you know, uh, lineage uh, of apes and humans seems to have arisen there, um, other you know, parts of the uh, uh, primate family tree may have uh, been centered elsewhere in the world. So Asia might have been uh, an earlier center for the anthropoid primates. And I apologize, I forgot to mention something. Um, these prosimians spread throughout the world, including North America had uh, prosimian uh, primates uh, early in uh, the Cenozoic. Um, at the time, North America was more tropical, as was the world. The world was warmer and wetter. Um, but then as it became cooler and drier, the vegetation of North America changed and it lost its primates. So today we have squirrels leaping from branch to branch. Um, earlier in the Cenozoic in North America, there were uh, primitive uh, primates doing the same. So uh, by the end of the Eocene, there was a group called the anthropoid uh, primates, uh, which had a few features more in common um, uh, whether it be more bony protection around the eye, more features of the nervous system. Uh, when you compare uh, uh, humans, uh, uh, humans have more in common with other anthropoid primates uh, than they do, say, uh, with uh, the lemurs. Um, so there were primitive anthropoid primates all over the world. And then something happened, which we'll never be able to uh, explain fully. Somehow, some of the uh, primitive anthropoid uh, primates got to South America. Now, uh, South America had separated from Africa by this point. The continents of Gondwana were drifting apart, but the Southern Atlantic was nowhere near as wide as it is today. How this happened, we don't know. Was there a storm and in the storm there was a, a big tree or a floating mass of vegetation uh, with some, you know, uh, monkeys or at least a pregnant female, you know, uh, in 
the branches and, you know, several, you know, after a week or two, you know, uh, landed on the shore of South America and now began to colonize a new continent that had no primates. Um, we don't know. Uh, but it, it, in any case, uh, the South American primates uh, today give us a very good um, idea of what primitive anthropoids all throughout uh, the world uh, would uh, look like. Uh, anthropoids like those uh, once lived in, say, Africa and Eurasia, um, but are no longer uh, there. So from primates comes a subgroup known as the anthropoid primates. Uh, uh, by the end of the uh, Eocene, they get to South America. And so thus, if you were to look at modern primates, the prosimians are the most primitive uh, branch. The South American uh, primates, the New World monkeys, they are the next most primitive branch. They're anthropoids. But by the epoch after the Eocene, a new group of primates had evolved, um, the Catarine primates. The Catarine primates include um, the monkeys of the old world. So this would be primarily Africa and Asia, although the Barbary ape does live on Gibraltar, which is Europe. So technically Europe as well, but primarily Africa and, um, uh, and Asia, um, and then also the apes. And so catarine primates are a subgroup of anthropoids. So anthropoids include um, the new world monkeys, the South American monkeys and uh, catarine uh, primates, uh, which include monkeys and apes. So not all monkeys are equally related. In fact, the old world monkeys are more closely related to uh, humans and apes uh, than they are uh, to the South American monkeys. One of the big ways that you can tell is that early in Catarine history, they lost a premolar. And so that uh, the Catarine primates have two premolars uh, and three molars, whereas um, and the lemurs and the South American monkeys, uh, they have a third uh, uh, premolar. So there would be other uh, changes as well, some shared features of uh, nervous and uh, muscular systems, uh, but that uh, tooth change, uh, that is an easy one. So notice that in the catarines, this does not include the South American monkey nor the uh, lemur. Um, it includes the old world monkeys and apes and um, there are shared features of the catarines that they have descended from their, uh, the, the common ancestor. And one of the big ones is while a South American monkey like such as this howler has three uh, premolars while the lemur has three premolars. Uh, when you then look at uh, the old world monkeys and uh, the apes like that given, there are only uh, two. And so uh, there are fossils of um, Catarine uh, primates, uh, starting with uh, Egyptopithecus, uh, which uh, seems ancestral to the old world monkeys and uh, the apes, as implied in the name Egyptopithecus, it's known from Egypt. And so Africa is an important center uh, for uh, the Catarine primates. And there are, are diverse uh, fossils known in, um, uh, in uh, this uh, uh, group. Um, of the things that the Catarines share, I have videos which go through them in uh, detail. Um, some, I think, um, you know, we can skip the uh, the veins which drain the uh, drain the uh, the brain uh, and the uh, jumping genes called transposons, which get introduced in the primate uh, uh, lineage. Um, but a couple of things I think are important. One is the Catarine primates begin to um, emphasize vision more than before. So there still was one nocturnal South American uh, monkey, but all of the catarines are diurnal coming out only during the day. Their eyes get bigger, the parts of the brain involved in uh, vision get bigger, and smell decreases. So uh, mammals originally placed an enormous importance on smell. You can see this a number of reasons, the size of you know, the olfactory bulb um, and the number of genes involved in olfactory receptors. There's maybe like a thousand different G protein coupled receptors, which are olfactory receptors. That's huge. If you only have you know, 20 to 30, say uh, 20 to 30,000 genes, if 1,000 are olfactory receptors, that's a huge percentage of your genome for perceiving smell. 
in most lineages of mammals and including lemurs and South American monkeys, all of these genes work. So they have a great ability to smell. But as you start to get into the higher primates, the catarines, um, a lot of these genes get broken and it doesn't seem to matter. And so that um, we have a very large number of these genes, like maybe half, that just don't work. So they're mutants. And so while our ancestors had functioning genes, um, many of these mutated and apparently it didn't matter much because we were using olfaction uh, less. And so there's a large number of pseudogenes which simply do not work. In addition, mammals have uh, two senses of smell. Not only is there the main olfactory uh, system to sense most odorants, there's also the vomeronasal system located in the vomer, um, whose primary uh, function is to perceive pheromones, those compounds in the sweat of other individuals. So when we sweat and produce body odor, this is something that the body does on purpose. Sweat could just be water. It doesn't have to have odor. But apocrine sweat glands make uh, apocrine sweat have odor on purpose because it communicates things about the individual and about their sexual state, about their rank in the social group, in the state of estrus, in females. Um, and apparently this is important for other members of the group. Now, for other mammals, if they're nocturnal, vision's less important, smell is more important. So that could be important. But with um, uh, uh, the catarine primates relying more on vision, um, this importance of pheromones became less important. And apparently there was a mutation in an important gene, the TRYP2 gene. And when that gene mutated, this system really no longer worked. So one mutation in one gene broke one of the two olfactory systems. Now, catarine primates still have it. You still have um, holes for your vomeronasal organ. You had vomeronasal organs, certainly as an embryo, you might still have it now. They just don't work. Um, they had a different set of hookups to the brain, and they don't work in any of the catarine primates because there was a function, uh, there was a break in uh, this one uh, gene, um, which obviously would change human dynamics. We, we rely on vision. You know, when dogs or other mammals meet each other, they're smelling each other. Humans don't do that because we just don't appreciate the, you know, compounds in, uh, in sweat uh, the way that uh, many mammals do. So catarine primates really begin to emphasize vision to a much greater degree and de-emphasize smell. The olfactory bulbs get smaller, many of the genes are, are mutated and functionless pseudogenes, and the second nasal, second olfactory system, the vomeronasal system, just doesn't work. And catarines get the ability to see in color. Now, um, just you know, a couple of clarifications. By that, I mean all mammals can see in color as far as I know, um, but they have dichromatic vision. They can distinguish between blue and red slash green. So they know the difference between red slash green, but they don't know the difference between red and green. This is why deer uh, don't notice a hunter's orange clothes because the orange is perceived as green. A bull in a bullfight doesn't care that you're waving a red cape in front of it. Um, you know, a green cape would do just as well. It's just that, you know, the picadors have been stabbing it and so the bull's rather angry about that. Now, um, the genes for uh, the opsin proteins, which detect red slash green light, are on the X chromosome. Now, what happens in some South American uh, monkeys is that there can be different forms of these uh, genes. Just like, you know, there are different genes for hair color. So in a population, you can have brown and black and red and yellow hair. Um, you can have blood type O and A and B. There are um, variations in New World monkeys where some of these genes are better at perceiving red and some of the genes are better at perceiving green. Now, for males, these are on the X chromosome, so males only get one. Males, that doesn't matter. But for females, if a female howler monkey, let's say, uh, if her father gave her um, a gene that's better at seeing red, and then her mother gave her a gene that's better at seeing green, then she essentially has trichromatic vision by dumb luck, just because of how the genes assorted, who her parents were and how they assorted at, at conception. So there are South American fem female monkeys which can have trichromatic vision. 
But in catarrhines, there was a gene duplication. This is a type of mutation that happens every now and then, an accident where sloppy crossing over means that instead of one gene, there are now two stuck to each other, two copies. But since genes can then vary over time, one of these got a little bit better at perceiving red, one of these got a little bit better at perceiving green. So amino acid changes in proteins changed which um, uh, types of light were best uh, perceived. And so while ancestral primates had one gene on the X chromosome for red and green light perception, once cataract primates gave, produced two genes and there were some uh, following mutations uh, which changed it a little, now one was better at seeing red and one was better at seeing green. Obviously, you can see how this um, would be beneficial when living in the trees. Most mammals would see this, where the leaves and the berries look alike, but prime, or cataract primates see this, where the, ber the red berries are clearly different from the green leaves. And given that you know, many primates feed on uh, fruits uh, to varying degrees, um, that clearly is an advantage. A great philosophical question is this. When did these changes happen? Because let's say the primates were, say, adapting to live in trees, and then their sense of smell, you know, deteriorated with mutations, and then they got, you know, you know, color vision. Um, well, then they were adapting to life in the trees, you know, anyway, this just made them better, and the senses of smell, those mutations didn't matter. Or imagine this scenario. Imagine, say, the mutations in smell came first. Well, now you have animals that can't smell as well as their ancestors did, so they're deficient in something. So now if there was a, a, a mutation which made their vision better, well, that now has an added value. So maybe um, those changes in olfaction came first, and now once there was a mutation for better vision, that became especially important in animals which had um, a lesser uh, sense of smell. So cataract primates see better and they spread all throughout uh, the old uh, world, uh, Africa, Europe, and Asia. From ancestral cataract primates, not only do we get the first, uh, uh, the old world uh, monkeys today, but also the apes. And the defining feature of the ape is the loss of the external, excuse me, the external tail. Um, external tails are great. South American monkeys can hang by their tails, they can grab things with their tails. Imagine how much fun an external tail would be. Um, apes lose them. Why? Well, the answer is uh, quite simple. If you look at where the pubic bones are, the pubic bones offer support for pelvic organs as long as you're on all fours. So if you're going to be, have your back horizontal, uh, your pubic, like, like these monkeys, so these are catarine uh, primates, but they're monkeys, old world monkeys. Um, notice that while they're in that position, the pubic bones are supporting the weight of gravity pulling against their urinary and um, uh, reproductive organs. But if they were to stand, all right, what then would uh, support um, the, uh, the urinary and reproductive organs? The answer is nothing, all right? Um, so uh, at the end, I'll go to a PowerPoint presentation and you know show this again. Um, but ah, let me do that now. Um, there is no support if you are now going to try to be vertical, all right. So if you're going to change your um, uh, your body's uh, position, well, let me get this over here. That's uh, if you're going to change your body's uh, position and now hang uh, vertically, um, what supports the urinary and reproductive structures? Notice there are no bones there at all. There's a hole. So if you're going to, to be uh, have your back horizontal, the pubic bones support it. But if you're going to be vertical, look at that. You just have skin. Do you want to trust your urinary reproductive organs not falling through the floor of your body cavity because of your skin? You know, um, and so uh, here's the, the human uh, uh, pelvis, um, but then the same would be true of other apes. So here's a chimpanzee um, uh, pelvis here. Um, so the very first apes 
uh, proconsul was the first ape from about 20 million years ago in the uh, Miocene. Um, they lost their external tail, right? Um, and as a result, uh, the tail muscles, which used to just wag the tail, etc., could now support the uh, body's weight. So look at this gibbon. You know, it's holding its body uh, uh, upright, um, and it's going to hang upright more. Look at that gorilla climbing, you know, up right here. It needs more support than just the skin, especially, you know, gorillas are big. You know, most monkeys tend to be small, but if you're going to try to be uh, large, that's a problem. You'll see in a second another uh, gibbon uh, walking by here. Monkeys can't do that. Monkeys can't walk up, right? Because then they would just have skin holding up their urinary and reproductive uh, organs. And that would certainly not be enough uh, support, especially if they wanted to increase their size the way that many apes uh, do. And so apes sacrifice something. They sacrifice their external tail. And so our tails are just this reduced coccyx bone where some vertebrae fuse together. But the muscles that used to move the tail um, or raise, for example, when a, a horse defecates, it raises its anus. Um, so all of those muscles were there, but instead of now moving the, the tail and the tail region, now they can form a sling, what's known as a pelvic diaphragm. So when an ape stands or hangs upright, it's not just the skin supporting its urinary and pelvic organs. It's uh, now um, this uh, pelvic diaphragm made by these modified uh, tail muscles. So that was the change in catarine primates, which then defined the apes. They lost their tails, and these modified tail uh, muscles uh, could now uh, support the pelvic organs. So that now that they could uh, hang upright, and many of the, them do, gibbons, orangutans spend a lot of time hanging, um, but then they can also then walk upright. Many can walk up right to varying degrees. One fossil ape, Oreopithecus, might have been more of a frequent uh, upright walker, but obviously in the human lineage, this becomes important. So that tail, that's important. We could go through um, other changes as well, and these videos do, um, where there are more things that apes share, excluding the um, uh, the monkeys, uh, such as uh, enlargements in various regions of the brain, like the cerebellum or you know, specific lobes of the brain, uh, et cetera. So as of the Miocene uh, epoch, there are apes. Um, the first apes were, were still kind of small. They spread throughout the world. And from these more primitive apes, uh, there are uh, the gibbons uh, alive uh, today. And so uh, apes also form this nested you know, family groups. There are different branches. The first branch and uh, the, you know, the most primitive branch compared to you know, ourselves and our lineage um, are uh, the, uh, the gibbons, uh, which uh, there are diverse uh, species. And every time I look, there are more species than we thought there were um, living in uh, Indonesia and Southeast Asia uh, uh, today, right? And so uh, they can hang uh, uh, more. And so um, uh, there are uh, gibbons. Now within then the apes, there is a subgroup um, which uh, for a while were referred to as quote the higher apes. Uh, more recently there was kind of a restructuring of taxonomic uh, terms and now the uh, term is the family hominidae. Um, so family names end in day, D-A-E. Um, if you look at very old taxonomic groups, humans were like put in their own group, hominidae, that you know we are our own biological family. Um, but now we realize, other than ego, there's, there's no reason to put humans in their own biological family. We're not that different from other apes. Biologically speaking, you can't um, justify putting us in a group all by ourselves. And so um, now uh, the, uh, the group the family then includes uh, us and other apes. For a while it was called uh, Pungidae, um, and, and so now Hominidae, the family that humans are in, include what used to be the higher apes. This would be uh, orangutans, gorillas, chimps, and ourselves. So notice, so the family of Hominidae, the higher apes, do not include gibbons, they are apes, but that's an earlier 
uh, uh, branch from primitive apes. Uh, then there were the higher apes, which include orangutans like um, uh, the one you see uh, here, uh, gorillas, uh, chimpanzees, and uh, humans. Um, uh, hominidae apes spread throughout the world. There are diverse fossils, some in Asia, including uh, things like Sivapithecus and Ramapithecus, which are uh, arguably the uh, ancestors of uh, orangutans. Um, one other uh, group was there was a Gigantopithecus. There was apparently a huge ape uh, that lived in um, Asia. And when Homo erectus would ultimately get to Asia, uh, they uh, shared caves. And what happened, we don't know, but you know, Homo was still here and Gigantopithecus is not. So if they conflicted, we have an idea of who the winter, uh, winter was. Since there are only jaw fragments and teeth, we don't know how big Gigantopithecus uh, could uh, reach, uh, but estimates have been from 12 feet tall to 20 feet tall that I have seen. Um, and so uh, the Holmididae apes, which include orangutans, um, they are a subgroup of the apes. And then within that family of Holmididae, D-A-E, there is the subfamily Holmininae, which has the apes which are most closely related to each other. So this would include orangutans and Gigantopithecus. So orangutans, uh, they are Holmididae apes, but not the subfamily Homininae apes. The Homininae apes, they include only uh, humans, uh, gorillas, and chimpanzees. There are two uh, species of uh, chimpanzee uh, alive uh, today. So that's now the subfamily. Um, of the subfamily, we think that gorillas were the first to separate from human lineages, maybe say nine million years ago. Um, and then between five and seven, and I think more close to seven, um, seven million years ago, then the chimpanzee lineages uh, split from us. So out of all of the organisms on Earth, these three are the most closely related to us. So uh, humans, chimps, and gorillas, we form a subfamily homininae. So, um, and of the two, chimps are more closely related to humans. Now, not only does that mean that humans, uh, that the chimps are most closely related to humans, it also means that humans are most closely related to chimps. You know, chimps are our closest relative, but we are chimps' closest relative. Just as a, you know, chimp could, you know, say we could argue you know, that they are, say, 97% uh, human, we could argue that humans are the 97% chimp. Um, so, you know, the simil similarities are great. There's no part of the human brain that chimps don't have. Many of our parts are just bigger. Um, there's no major muscle that we don't, that the chimps and humans differ. There's only minor, you know, things in say the forearm where there's a duplication, you know, here uh, or uh, there. And I'll get the genetic differences in a second. Or well, actually, um, genetically probably the biggest difference, uh, although we don't know when exactly it occurred, is in chromosomes. Now let's just be clear. When you look at uh, groups of related animals, their chromosomes vary. So if you look at rodents or mice, you know, members of this family or that family, uh, they don't have the same number of chromosomes. And actually that's important. That may be one of the reasons why there's different species. You know, different organisms can't have offspring together because they have different numbers of, the cross, uh, of chromosomes and their uh, embryos uh, simply die or fail to be born or they're not healthy or whatever. So even among lemurs, not all lemurs in this family have the same number of chromosomes. Some have 46, some have 66. Not all lemurs in this family have the same number of chromosomes. Some have 40, some have 70. In this lemur family, some have 20, some have 38. Um, in these South American monkeys, there are variations in chromosomes. Um, now, chromosomes are weird. There's variants. There's different things going on. Every now and then I, I read that, you know, the diploid count in a species even includes an odd number, which is, you know, odd, but, you know, I would refer you to the references on that one. But in any case, um, when you look at South American monkeys, when you look at uh, old world catarine monkeys, they have different numbers of chromosomes. So this seems to be a common type of genetic change and important arguably in speciation. The reason that these two species are separate and don't reproduce is that they have different numbers of uh, chromosomes. And if they tried, their offspring would not uh, thrive. If you were to compare the genome of, say, humans and, say, uh, chimps, gorillas, orangutans, um, this is what you see. They, they almost identical. We have the same number of chromosomes, pretty much. The genes are in the same places. So genetically, we are super similar. 
But one big thing leaps out of this is humans have this big chromosome two, our second largest chromosome here in pink, and these other apes don't. But they do have this one, which matches the top half of our chromosome two. And then they have this one, which matches the bottom half of our chromosome two. So what seems to have happened is that a mutation occurred where two smaller ape chromosomes fused to make a larger one. And so you had some apes with 48 chromosomes and now a new group of apes which had 46. And this might have been important in separating the two so that this group over here didn't reproduce with this group over here um, because they couldn't, they are not well because they had different numbers of chromosomes and their uh, embryos would very often um, fail uh, to uh, thrive. Uh, so that seems to be a great uh, uh, genetic, one of the largest genetic differences between humans and others. Now, um, I have videos that go through this, and so I'm not going to put this in the summary video. Um, most human proteins um, uh, are either identical to the protein of chimps in the amino acid order, or uh, on average vary by one amino acid. We are extremely similar to chimps. Now, clearly there are genetic differences. Chimps and humans are not the same. But the number of genetic differences, so when you say um, there are 35 million single nucleotide changes between the genome of a chimp and the genome of a human, that sounds like a huge number, but once you start comparing other animals, you realize, no, that's about what you'd expect in two groups which were separated for seven million years. So the differences genetically between humans and chimps, it's not extraordinary, it's actually average what you would expect in lineages that, um, uh, that were separated that amount of time. And if you uh, have ever heard humans and chimps are 97% identical or 96 or 98, um, the difference is uh, there's different kinds of genetic changes. And then there's things like insertions and deletions. And from one researcher to another, you could kind of vary how you count those. And so, you know, this person doing it this way can come up with 97, this person can come up with 98, this person can come up with 96. So th there's explanations for that. So don't um, uh, get hung up. But for example, if you were to compare the amino acid sequence of human beta hemoglobin, each of these letters stands for an amino acid. So M stands for methionine, V stands for valine, et cetera. A chimpanzee has the exact same sequence. So when they make beta hemoglobin, they put the exact same amino acids in the exact same order as we do. Gorillas have one uh, difference. Um, I think, uh, I'll come up here, orangutans I think have uh, two. Um, and, and so the genetic similarity is uh, closest between humans and chimps. Not only are they our closest relative, we are their uh, closest uh, relative. Um, now you could look at that with genes, you can look at that with behavior. Um, and so I would uh, refer you to uh, other uh, books that I'll just try to uh, re refer now. So for example, there are uh, you know, great researchers who have worked with chimps in the wild or who have um, uh, tried to teach chimps sign language and written books about it. So you know, by all means, read those books. Don't you know, uh, refer to me. Um, but uh, for example, chimps use tools. All right, and you know this type of, of tool lets them fish termites out of logs. This type of tool helps them soak up water. This tool lets them sit on areas which are thorny. And not only do they have tools, but they're not instinct, they are taught. So this group of chimps uses this tool, uh, that group of chimps uses that tool. They are taught from one generation to the next. Um, and so that is not human culture, but culture could, you know, loosely be de defined as just, you know, uh, uh, taught um, and non-instinctual uh, behaviors uh, from one generation to the next, in which case chimps would have, you know, a primitive form of culture. Um, chimps can't talk. Um, the main reason for that is their vocal tract just has the wrong shape. And so the hyoid bone, how far the, the sphenoidal section of the pharynx, it just doesn't, doesn't let them make the repertoire of sounds that humans do. One of the things that, that humans' uh, ancestors did is our hyoid position changed, our shape, our, our face flattened, you know, this area of the throat is different. Um, and while there's some disadvantages to these changes, we choke more on our food, um, we need, you know, orthodontics. I, you know, have had eight teeth yanked out of my mouth and braces for three years to make them all kind of line up. 
um, because my ancestors had a face that stuck out to here. I have a shorter face, but I have the same number of teeth. So tooth crowding was an issue with me and my orthodontist uh, growing up. And I'm sure many of you have the same um, uh, uh, the, the same uh, uh, story. Um, but these changes allowed us to talk. And so it was changes that occurred in you know, the shape of this area, which allowed for speech. Now, chimps are capable of sign language. They have been, and, and others, well, such as gorillas, uh, they've learned you know, hundreds of words in their vocabulary. They can change their word order, like you tickle me means something different than me tickle you. There was a case where a female chimp taught human sign language to an infant chimp. So this was a human language being taught from one non-human to another um, non-human. Uh, uh, and so there are clearly differences, but the differences aren't as great as we uh, think. And actually, the geneticists who study this can actually identify specifically what differences seem to be crucial in making human, the human condition different from a, a typical ape. So for example, changes in this gene, FOXP2, uh, accumulated faster than in other genes. Um, it's active in the brain um, and seemed to be uh, crucial in some of the, the um, differences which enhanced uh, language. So not only you know, can we can actually identify those changes which seem to be most significant in, um, uh, in uh, humanity. Uh, uh, so one last thing is clearly humans are different from chimps and other primates. But when you study variations in primates and other groups, you realize that the things that separate us from chimps really aren't all that significant when you compare what makes one ape different from another, one monkey different from another. So I have this video here, which simply um, says, if you were to, to say, take uh, the degree of change, which makes one lemur different from another, and apply that to say a chimp head, well, that would easily um, encompass the change that would be needed to make that chimp head into a human head or more so. So I have a video that explains that. Um, but let me just kind of go to uh, PowerPoint images, which you know maybe explain uh, the same um, uh, thing. Um, so uh, if I went to say two monkeys, uh, and you know sometimes uh, this would be a separate set of videos. Um, but there are those who say, oh, I oppose the idea that uh, you know, humans and, and chimps could share the same evolutionary ancestor, and that's fine. Um, but some of them say, oh, but monkeys, you know, such as these South American monkeys, they, you know, they're, they're related, but humans aren't related to chimps. But if you were to actually study the skull differences between two South American monkeys, this is far greater than the amount of difference between a human and a, and a chimp. And so there are individuals who say, oh, I feel that these differences arose in say a couple thousand years, but the much smaller differences between humans and, and chimps, oh, that could never arise not even in millions of uh, years. So if you look here, there are some who would say, oh, apes never evolved from monkeys, but I think monkeys have shared a common ancestor. Well, these are all old world monkeys and this given is an ape. Um, and when I ask my students, pick the one which seems least like the others, you know, they typically pick the baboon or mandrels also have an elongated face. So you know, we could have used that one as well. Um, but once again, trying to, to share, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the concept uh, that, you know, many people feel, oh, you know, these monkeys share a common ancestor, but their difference in skulls is far greater than what separates uh, humans uh, from chimps. But that will be the uh, topic of the next, uh, next uh, videos. So this video attempted to summarize all of my other videos, uh, which start uh, 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs died when cousins of primates uh, existed known as by the, uh, say, 55 million years ago or so, um, there were the very first primates. So within the group of placental mammals, there's now an order known as primates. By the end of the Eocene, there is a subgroup of this called the anthropoid primates. By the Oligocene, there's a subgroup of that known as catarine primates. By the Miocene, there's a subgroup of catarines known as apes. And then later in uh, the Miocene, there's a subgroup known as the family Hominidae. The Gibbon lineage separates, and so now there's a subfamily known as Homininae. 
the orangutan lineage separates, and now there's a, a lineage which includes gorillas, chimps, and humans. The gorilla lineage separates, say, nine million years ago, five to seven million years ago. The chimp lineages separate. There's two species of chimp alive today. And now, as of, say, seven million years ago, there were fossil organisms which were ancestral to only one group alive still today, humans. And that will then be the a topic of the next videos and playlists. Come on.